Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Edison and Dr. M. Denton. Hello and welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. Uh, my name is Josh Edison and oh, look who's decided to join us today. It's Dr. M. Did you have, have time in your busy schedule of swanning off with other people's podcasts to show up here, did you? You're, Did you? You're just you're just using this as a deflection from the fact that you couldn't record on our normal podcast. Don't day. try so to change the subject. You, sir, were on the Scholars Circle podcast last week with young Pat What's his name from What's his thing University, Deacon. I listened to it. I'm not making stuff up off the top of my head and half remembering facts. Don't deny Pat, it. So Pat, it's written all over your face. Pat who? See, if Stokes. I if I'd actually written the information on my face, that would have been funny. I suppose it would have. Uh, but no, actually, well, yes. so, so you're on another podcast this week. Quite interesting, actually. Fun little conversation. Who is, is Scholar's Circle? Is it an Auckland University one? or a... So the Scholar's Circle is part of the Big Question series that the University of Auckland runs. Well, the Scholar's Circle is actually older, so an American academic who came to Auckland brought the series with her. Uh, Scholar's Circle broadcasts in 10 US cities. In the US, strangely enough, I did it. Yeah, I know. I mean, broadcasting it in US cities in the US is amazing, uh, and it broadcasts on a weekend. So basically, we actually recorded the piece about three weeks ago. Uh, they had to wait for some reason to get the transcription done before they were going to release it to the world. So now there's a version of it out which has got my dulcet tones. Or, if you don't like listening to me, you can read you my can. words as transcribed. Mm, I actually read the transcription first, because I think that's what you linked to originally, and then found the recording. And I see that they that, that edited it down just a little, but mostly just taking out digressions and a few ums and ums. Oh, I actually haven't listened to it. so I, mm. I actually never listen to things I'm in. Ah. I well, don't watch things uh, back. I don't listen to them. I plan to learn nothing from my media appearances over time. That's not a bad policy. Nevertheless, if you feel like looking up the Scholars Circle, uh, I, I found it an interesting little chat, really. Just some more sort of general terms about conspiracy theories and the philosophy thereof. Indeed, eh? mm. With Pat Stokes from With Deakin Stokes University. From Deakin University. That's exactly not who I Pat said. something something from, from something, something something Deakin, 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 I think. Deakin. Yes. yes, there we go. So I was essentially right. Yes. Essentially, it got to the, the, the ultimate. I still think it would have been funnier if you had told me that you had forgotten his last name for me to have put on a post it note, Pat Stokes from Deakin University. Mm. And then you said, it's written all over your face, and you could have ripped the post it note off of my face and then read it. Probably could have. Visual gag have, yeah. for, the, for the, the YouTube viewers. Well, a Not potential so much visual for the, gag mm. for the YouTube viewers, except that you didn't think of it. Why do I have to think of the visual gags when you are in charge of the visual content? Well, yes, that's true. I, largely caused by the fact that I didn't realise I'd forgotten Pat Stokes' name until I actually went to say Pat Stokes' name and suddenly found a hole in my memory where a name should have been. It's all that drinking, isn't it? Mm, so much drinking. All the hooch. Yeah. Get it, it down me const- every all day, every constantly day. Guzzling constantly guzzling hooch. Constantly guzzling it famous down. for being drunk all mm. the time. I'm drunk right now. Good. Mm. Should we do a podcast? We, we probably should, yeah. yeah. Oh, actually, I, if we're going to plug things, I should say I made that game. You did? I made a game. It's called Stay in the Box. It's about a box and you have to stay in it. You can go to gamejolt.com and search for Stay in the Box and you can find it, play it. Should a game really last a couple of minutes, you might find it fun. So just... I've, I've lasted about a minute and a half playing Stay in the Box. Does anything more happen as oh, time yes. goes by? Oh, it does, yes. It gets more, more and more. Do- things happen. Three minutes, 12, I think, is my best, but I should practice. I, I sort of... It's hard making a game and it's like calibrating how tricky you should make it. And I'm thinking, well, I'm having trouble doing this. And I did make it. But on the other hand, I am 43 years old and have the reflexes of a 43-year-old, possibly the younger generation. Yeah, except that you have the reflexes of a 43-year-old who is used to playing yeah. games with a joystick with a single input button. We played games mm. differently than young people. God, we sound, we sound like old people That's talking about we are. the youth today. But in mm. our day... Your joystick only had one button. Oh, Unless you were a console gamer, at which point you at least had four. Mm. But you weren't a console gamer. No, because we couldn't afford we didn't, consoles well, in this country. We didn't really get them. Nintendo was never really a big... Like, they, they, Nintendo did exist in New Zealand, but it wasn't a big thing. Yeah, it was always very rare to know someone mm. who had an 8-bit Nintendo machine. You were more likely to find a Master System. Mm. It wasn't really until the PlayStation 
came around that really started getting... Oh, was, you had a bit of the old Sega, a bit of your Mega Drives and your, yeah. whatever they were. But anyway, that is not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about a different kind of technology, an older technology, and yet new for the time. We're here to talk about Zeppelins. So let's do that. We all know about UFOs. UAPs. Sorry, yes. Unidentified aerial phenomena. Do, uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> and the associated conspiracy theories surrounding why governments, corporations, and your mum deny their existence. But before we had tales of flying saucers or experimental aircraft, indeed before we even knew what flying saucers or aircraft even were, there were mysterious dirigibles or zeppelins being spotted in the night sky. Today we are going to talk about Victorian zeppelin sightings. Not just that, but mysterious Victorian zeppelin sightings. See, sometimes people saw zeppelins where no zeppelins should be. And sometimes people saw Zeppelins before Zeppelins even existed. Mm. So, were there heavily mustachioed, steampunk-esque Victorian inventors racing through our skies over a century ago? Are these just misinterpreted flying saucer sightings, or is it just a case of the 1880s and just a flock of seagulls? That was a nice reference to get in there. Yeah, just, I'm yeah. actually very, very mm. pleased with that. And the fact there's probably only going to be three people who get it, made it all the worthwhile mm. or even all the more worthwhile same thing yeah so yeah i mean we've talked about ufos before and the attendant conspiracy theories but and, and i'm sure we have mentioned at least in passing the idea that before there were little green men coming out of flying saucers or there women were, indeed or actually it's a, little we, green uh, beings yes, yes, precisely. We, could let, have. let's not assume gender indeed. for extraterrestrial life forms that is entirely correct. Uh, but before we had uh, space aliens and um, and mysterious rockets and spaceships and what have you, um, we had mysterious. Well, actually, Ridge, I mean, the history of of UFOs prior to a couple of hundred years ago, they tended to be sort of have a bit of a biblical bent, didn't they? They were sort of weird divine lights in the sky and so on. Well, yes. I mean, it was often a supernatural mm. phenomena related to whatever religious practice you had at any particular point in time. Uh, and then there's a huge history of modern-day ufologists trying to reinterpret light in the sky as recorded in historical texts or quasi-historical texts like the Bible. And they go, oh, that's evidence that in Ezekiel, what Ezekiel is reporting is in fact a UFO, ipso facto, an alien spacecraft. Oh, we've got evidence that, you know, ancient gods were in fact astronauts mm. or things of that particular type. But then as, as um, the world became more industrialized and technology marched on, um, we started to see the, the rise of... Um, mysterious objects in the sky being being thought of as being techno you know uh, technological artifacts human made things and so around the time i mean certainly hot air balloons have been around for several centuries um you're a hot air balloon human being but it, i don't actually have a response to that that was just a little bit too far out of it um but so the the idea of human as beings becoming airborne yeah, you've been you've been over you've been getting into the your mum sauce again, haven't you? <laughs> I know. I really, was I, really, a... I really probably should stop. Mm. Uh, especially because I forgot what I was saying. Yes, no. So the idea of human beings um, becoming aloft due to due to uh, human made contrivances was was sort of becoming a thing. And so we get the idea of the, uh, you know, people are still seeing mysterious things in the sky, not knowing what they are, but they start being looked at as, as um, some sort of actual flying craft, often not with alien beings in them, but with human beings in them. Yes, I mean, there's a huge history of the sociology of interpretation of lights in the sky, which actually comes out quite nicely in the literature on abduction experiences. So along with UFOs, the middle of the 20th century was rather replete with stories of people being abducted at night by grey space aliens, green space aliens, Nordic space aliens and the like, which actually talks quite nicely to the fact that where you are in the world, your interpretation of who these figures are changes quite dramatically. America is mostly the greys, northern Europe are the kind of Nord or Viking-esque like cre creatures, and people quickly discovered that abduction experiences as reported in the middle of the 20th century 
really do resemble quite closely witch abduction experiences as reported in earlier centuries, which then, then led people to go, well, maybe it's the same phenomena, but the threat of the other, the thing which we think is the mysterious thing out there causing it, has gone from being witches which we're afraid of to extraterrestrial life forms, which then leads to the question, so what's the actual root phenomena? Was it always witches and people just misinterpret alien abduction experiences, uh, which are actually witch ones? Or were UFOs abducting people back in the day? Or is there some other cause which culture and society interprets as witches at one point and aliens at another? Mm. And then you have the interesting period kind of in between, which is what we're looking at today, where most of these... Uh, sightings are either sort of mysterious, we don't know what it was ones, or ones where they give a very sort of um, down to earth is the exact wrong phrase to use, but that sort of prosaic explanation where it's human beings and the fear seems to be more of a, a foreign military power than of any sort of um, supernatural phenomenon. So it's, and in the, in the, particularly at this time of the year, it is the Germans. Who, or the Prussians. Well, the Prussians, yeah. I mean, obviously, slightly different political landscape. But in the end of the 1800s and the start of the 1900s, um, Germany was developing these dirigibles or zeppelins. What's the difference between a dirigible and a zeppelin? I think zeppelin is actually named after the person who invented that particular form uh, of the dirigible. Go. And, of course, now I'm just thinking about that wonderful line from Frisco County G Junior. Not a Led Zeppelin. Yeah, I think he's building his stairway to heaven. Mm, great show. Yeah, go watch Briscoe County Junior after you've finished listening to this podcast. That's your homework for this week. Mm. Um, yeah, so I mean, people were worried about Germany's growing military power and whether they might start causing trouble, and, and they would eventually be proved right when um, along came World War One, which we've talked about in the past as well, and obviously it's a lot more complicated than just Germany were being dicks, but they kind of were, and that was kind of part of it. Um, so we start getting these weird sightings. So in the 1850s and 60s in the US, we have um, more than one instance of these quote-unquote luminous serpents. So things, these sort of elongated shapes, appeared to be glowing, appeared to be metallic. The phrase scales comes up more than once, having metallic scales flying through the sky. And... Um, but no one ever, from what I read, no one really seemed to come up with much of an explanation. It was just, hey, we saw this weird thing. Isn't that weird? Yes, and the problem is because this is also an e era before photography, although it's a kind of interesting aspect that as the growth of cameras we hold in our pockets and video cameras, which we also are also our cameras we hold in our pockets, have become popular, UFO sightings have become less well documented with mm. time but of course in this particular point in time we're talking at a point where there is no way to instantly capture an image at all so we've got no real idea of what people were seeing other than in many cases third or fourth hand accounts of so joe across the county he was talking with Luann, and Luann had been talking with Jeremiah, and Jeremiah saw the snake in the sky. Mm. And I don't know what accent I'm doing, but it's going to turn into Batman voice. Sure, yeah, go for Batman. Um, yeah, I think there was one case where supposedly like a class full of school children had seen one of this thing, and there were, there were sort of sketches and drawings and stuff, some of which looked a vaguely sort of Zeppelin-esque. Um, and then sort of moving later into the 1800s and going into the early 1900s, you had um, more of these sightings of things that people did seem to be um, identifying as, as actual Zeppelins. Um, now, I had to look this up myself because I wasn't quite sure. The Wright brothers apparently first flew in 1903. In Kitty Hawk. In Kitty Hawk. I had a fight with someone on Twitter this morning about whether our own Richard Pierce mm. flew before 1903. And the argument is that Richard Pierce himself said... He didn't fly before the Wright brothers, and he would probably know. You'd think so. Yes, I mean, that, that's a completely different issue from what we're talking about today, but there are, I mean, powered flight isn't something the Wright brothers imagined completely out of the blue. Um, no, there was a huge was, competition was, yeah, going on everyone for, was going for it. at least a, a decade prior with the kind of things that we now call planes, but actually for decades prior with things that would turn out not to work as aircraft mm. at all. 
Yeah, and so here in New Zealand we had a, an inventor by the name of Richard Pierce who was working on stuff around the same time as the Wright brothers, did actually achieve powered flight, but um, by all accounts achieved it slightly after the Wright brothers did. But then there's always been the stories of, oh, did he actually, you know, records back then people weren't quite sure, did he actually beat the Wright brothers to it? But kind of doesn't look like he did. Well, I mean, he said he didn't, mm. and you'd think that if he had... He probably would have said yes. something. I mean, that said, he, it's not like he um, saw the Wright brothers playing and took down designs, what have you. He, oh, no, he invented I mean, he his was, own yeah. thing entirely yeah, by himself. He was trying to... He, and, I mean, there are reports that in about 1902 he was able to make short hops, but the whole point about flight is you need a sustained flight, mm. and Pierce didn't achieve that before the Wright brothers did. At any rate, uh, but before the Wright brothers, 1896... Um, is the year I, I saw in a few different sources of saying that this sort of when the Zeppelin craze first kind of started, that's when you had the the, the first sort of rash of sightings of these mysterious airships. Um, so they, they tended to be at night. Um, people would sort of hear strange sounds, see flashing lights from coming up above. Um, and it, it, then there would be the occasional sights, sightings during the day, usually of, of a downed craft, you'd, uh, w which where um, you would see people sort of, you know, repairing it before taking off again. Um, and I believe in, in all, or, if, uh, or at least most of these cases, if um, crew members could be seen aboard these, these mysterious airships, they were very definitely human beings yes. and often yeah. foreign human beings. Yes, and by foreign, either from a foreign nation or not from around these parts. Mm. Um, and I guess the point is that um, much as with UFO sightings that continue even today, you sort of get the idea that it's technology that's kind of understand, that's like comprehensible and yet nevertheless in advance of what is around today. So there was even talk of supposedly uh, some of these things having electric motors um, and, you know, pe people could, rec could kind of see them for what they were, and yet what they were was something that shouldn't quite have existed at that time. Yes, I mean, so the first Zeppelin, as we know them, flew on the 2nd of July in the year of our Lord, 1900, and they weren't actually used in military service until about nine years later. Mm. So the sightings we're talking about are either sightings which predate the first Zeppelin, or, in one exciting case, post-date the first, first Zeppelin, but occur in a location where there were no Zeppelins. Hmm. Are you talking about this location that we're in right now? Yes, this living room. This actual there were living no room. Zeppelins in this living room in historic memory. No, that's entirely true. But yes, no, New Zealand, Aotearoa, has its own history of, of, of Zeppelin sightings. Of lights in the sky. Mm. Uh, although actually before that, did you want to talk about the Arkansas one? Yes, yeah, so this is a delightful so is a American one. case. Mm. So this occurs back on May 6th of 1897 in the Ochika Mountains, where Constable John J. Sumter Jr. and Deputy Sheriff John McLemore were investigating reports of cattle rustling. And so they go out one night, because cattle rustlers tend to do their work after dark, because they want to do oh, things in sense. a way which people don't see mm -hmm. and they they see a bright light on the horizon which disappears behind the hilltops and so they kind of ride after it because they're at the stage probably assuming that's going to be the cattle rustlers with their with their lights and they keep it just they keep on chasing this light and then eventually their horses start to refuse to move because of the weird air around the environment and they start seeing people moving around with lights and then they go up to these people, demanding to know what they're doing, at which point a bearded man announced that he and two companions were travelling the country in an airship. Now, once again, this is 1897. This is before the accepted account of Zeppelins being in use has occurred. Now, their craft was cigar-shaped and about 60 feet long, and the mysterious man tried to coax both Sumter and McLemore aboard the craft, but they refused to go. And when they returned to the site later on in the night, there was no evidence of the men or the craft having ever been there. Dun, dun, dun. Indeed. So, I mean, it's, it's a little bit difficult to know what to make of that. I think one... Um... 
one, one suggestion, and this is where things get into conspiracy territory, is that what you have is sort of secret technology that was um, experimental prototypes being worked on in secret. And so while we believe that these things didn't come into use until sort of 10 or so years later, in actuality, there was a, a conspiracy to hide the fact that this, this um, new technology was being developed um, in advance of it, it becoming public knowledge. So, I mean, that's one thing, the idea. Or, or, I mean, maybe it, it wasn't a foreign power doing things. Maybe it was some wacky um, professor, what was his name, Wickwire? Of, oh, of yeah. Briscoe County Junior, some some wacky inventor on his own on his own steam, quite literally in some cases, um, perfecting some some mysterious new technology that the world wasn't quite ready to know about yet. But I mean, yeah, what 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 more can you say about that one? Some guys saw have a quite detailed and uh, account of mysterious things that they saw, but given that it's eighteen ninety seven. There's not really much else we can know about it. Although I must admit, if I was, say, a constable and the deputy sh sheriff bored at night chasing after cattle rustlers, and I found myself a nice moonshine still out in the mountains, and I downed a few jugs of that, and God knows what the quality of that moonshine actually is, mm. I might hallucinate a zeppelin. You might. But I mean, yeah. I mean, so the, yeah, so there is the question: Do they make up the story in time? Highly. Do they misinterpret something that they saw? Is this actually a case of an inventor who made a Zeppelin before the accepted date, which is within the realms of possibility, within a few years of the first Zeppelin being produced, people were trying to build aircraft at that particular point in time. So it's actually not beyond the realms of possibility that someone actually did invent a dirigible that worked before the officially accepted ones actually did occur. I mean, they, are, they do largely work on the same principle as a hot air balloon. Mm. So you can imagine variations of that being worked upon and one being successful and maybe only successful in a really limited way. Maybe it didn't work for particularly long. Mm. The person gave up. The person died. There's an entire literature based on cases where someone might invent something before the accepted date. But for reasons unknown, the invention just doesn't go anywhere or ever get heard about. But what's also interesting is it has a lot of features of abduction narratives we get in the 20th century, where you have people trying to entice you on board their ship. Mm. That's kind of interesting. It is. I, on a slight tangent here, I, I read an article a while ago about the, the whole abduction narrative and how it all appeared to come from a single case. There was that one case of a couple in the States who, uh, while driving home one night, saw this mysterious light moving around the sky. Um, and then many years later, under hypnosis, recounted this weird abduction experience, which then sort of became the template um, for the whole abduction thing. I remember, I, I believe one person's um, reckoned that he drove the road they drove, and there is a, there's a, a, a light, I can't remember what it was on, um, and given the way that there's sort of it's forested and the way the road sort of twists and turns and goes ups and up, up and down, it's kind of easy to become disoriented. And so even though the light is actually remaining in the same spot, it looks you could be mistaken, uh, you could be forgiven for thinking that it's actually moving around. Um, but the actual genesis of the abduction narrative was a weird one. And as, as people pointed out, that particular couple, they were uh, an interracial couple in the 60s in America. So keeping a low profile was pretty much their, their number one concern a lot of the time. So it's not like they were there for, for fame and attention. Yes, I, I know the case you're mm. talking about, and I can't remember the name of the... It's Bessie... Oh, I've, I've forgotten completely, mm. completely the name of the, of the husband in the particular case. It is a very famous case, yeah. and it is kind of taken to be the kind of urtext for abduction experiences as we understand them now. It's probably one of the most well-studied abduction experiences, and opinions by the people who study it seem to be all over the place mm. as to whether they made it up, whether they sincerely believed what they said without passing judgment on whether the event occurred, etc., etc. Yes, that is a funny one. But here we see um, some weird bearded inventor type just sort of 
casually asking people, hey, would you like to would you like to take a ride on my airship? Now admittedly, the thing which does strike me which is odd is that they don't take up the offer of being able to fly on an airship. If I in 1897, if I was wandering around the mountains and someone offered me a trip on their magical flying machine, I would take it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, entirely new technologies, like think things that we grew up with that, that existed long before we were born. I, I know um, my grandmother, who died back in the mid-90s, I think it was. I remember at her funeral uh, during the eulogy, they mentioned that when she was a girl in the early early 1900s, the first time she encountered a traction engine, she ran and hid behind a hill from it because this, this this weird technological thing that she'd never seen before was, was so odd and alien. So who knows, maybe encountering a genuinely, it's a, it's a sort of technology that you genuinely have no reference for would give one the willies. Wouldn't give me the willies. Well, who knows? Maybe your Williams are of a, a hardier brand. Uh, but anyway, let's get to the New Zealand one. Because like all, like all international crazes, New Zealand just loves to, to jump on board. Now, this is a sighting from the early 20th century. So we're talking 1908, uh, and the sightings continued into 1909. It's important to note... This is after the invention of the Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. So when people are reporting mysterious lights in the sky and ascribing them to Zeppelins, they're not ascribing them to a mysterious technology that is yet to come into being. They are describing something they know about. But what's interesting in the Aotearoa New Zealand case is we didn't have Zeppelins. No, so we, we didn't, didn't have, have any Zeppelins plying mm. our skies. We didn't have any travel by Zeppelin from one part of the country to another, let alone from, say, Aotearoa, New Zealand to Australia. There were no Zeppelins that we know of Indeed. in the country. Josh, hit me with our local Zeppelin story. Right, well, as you say, they... They started in 1908 with mysterious lights in the sky and strange noises and so on. Uh, but according to the Otago Daily Times, in July of 1909, uh, several uh, residents in uh, Kaitangata uh, saw a zeppelin for 30 minutes over the Wangaloa Hills. Um, the Evening Star newspaper reported this as an aircraft launched from the German vessel Seestern. So I don't know if this was a German vessel that was known to be in the area at the time or not. I didn't see any more detail on exactly what this, this German boat was. Um, and then for the next two months, there were apparently thousands of reports uh, from across the country of sightings of German airships. Um, and so, yes, here, here's, here's the case I was thinking of. In the town of Kelso, 23 school children and their adult minder claimed to have seen a, a craft swooping over the town. Um, which led to the police and a, and, a, and a search party tramping through the nearby mountains to find it. Uh, it was not found, as far as I'm aware. Um, at Kaka Point, I'm not sure where that actually is, um, several boys reported seeing an illuminating object that seemed about to land on the beach, and they ran away. Um, there was even a rumour that an airship had crashed near Waikata, killing two or three of the German craft who were aboard. Um, and then other ones, uh, then, then sort of around the same time, the Geraldine Guardi. Where's Geraldine? Now, that is a town I have heard of. Well, that's also in the South, uh, the South Yeah, I think they started Island, in the yeah. South, didn't they? And the sighting sort of moved north. Yeah, so a lot of these are progressed. around Christchurch. Mm. Uh, so in Geraldine, apparently a crowd saw a mysterious orb in the sky, although that apparently turned out to be a prank, uh, where some young boys had placed a candle inside a hollowed-out turnip and put it on a flagpole. <laughs> For them. Good for them. That's yeah. malarkey, hacky, wacky, wacky turn of the century hijinks. Although it's important to note that if it's so easy to fool the populace at this particular point in time with a candle in a turnip mm. on a flagpole, it does make you think how easy it was to fool people in other respects about Zeppelin's flying the skies. Indeed. Um, so July the 19th... Um, there was a wave of, of uh, reports coming in from around Omaru with more flickering lights in the sky. Um, some people claim to have heard a la uh, words being shouted in a guttural, harsh language by a helmeted figure aboard one of the airships. I assume they're, they're, what they're, they're getting at there is not English. And also helmeted figure, guttural Military. language, that is, that's mm. German again. Yep. Um, so we had, we've, we've had a long history of racism in this country. Oh, yes. Yes, we have. 
and pretty much everywhere else in the world also. But, um, yes, but sometimes people own... seem to think that we're a kind of utopic paradise. Well, yes. We're bad, th although actually after March 15th, people don't believe that no, at all. No. But prior to March 15th, mm. everyone thought we were kind of a place of racial harmony. And no, Not we really weren't no. or aren't. Mm. Uh, so only one airship was ever seen at a time and the sightings did tend to sort of move around the country sort of from south to north which led some to um, speculate that this was a single airship just just doing the rounds above New Zealand um, oh and there was a, a, a leading towards your flock of seagulls um, quote there was one final sighting um, much later by late August, uh, a dark cigar-shaped object near the Tapanui Hills, but apparently that was um, repeated flights of thousands of starlings. So it was one of those big, you, you, you've seen the videos on YouTube where you get a giant sort of flock of birds all moving as one um, in a strange shape. Can be quite an impressive sight, actually. Yes, and but, actually, um, given the lighting conditions, the way that light will reflect off them, at a distance, it can look like a solid object mm. because the light reflects off in a way where it kind of blinds you to that. It's a mass of moving parts becomes a single focal point. And so you can get an object which appears to move in a really, really erratic way. Mm. Um, and so that's that That was, I think we were, we were a little bit late to the game, I suppose. As you say, Zeppelins were actually existing technology by this time. Um, but it's interesting to see from a from a conspiracy theory sort of angle the fact that it's not it's not supernatural it's not aliens it's uh, the, the 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 these um, sort of secret hidden things going on are put down to possibly actions by a hostile or a foreign military power. Yes, because it's important to note this has never been resolved. So it's never been reported elsewhere that a foreign power had a zeppelin flying above the country. Now, of course, the allegation it was a German machine is based very largely on circumstantial mm. evidence, including what appears to be a completely erroneous report about finding three dead Germans that's never followed up or backed up by any other evidence. And so it is possible it could have been someone who bought a kit set Zeppelin of some particular kind, thought it might be fun to joyride around the country, but if they did... They never talked about it, so it never comes up that, oh yeah, my grandfather, he rode around a Zeppelin back in the South Island back in the day. There's just no history of ever, anyone ever admitting to being responsible for these sightings, which then leads to the question, was there a mysterious Zeppelin mm. plying the skies of the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand? Or... Are we seeing here a bunch of reports of lights in the sky, which is then turned into a narrative about a mm. Zeppelin? Yeah, sort of a, a bit of a craze, a bit of a, a bit of the, I, I, I guess, mass hysteria is the term they like to use. Is it a, an idea that's just been picked up and it's an interesting idea and there is a story behind it and, and so people uh, want to join in on the fun or as soon as they see something unexplained, think of this n n very yeah, interesting oh, well, narrative yeah, they've heard that, about. That's so. sighting just a few miles south of here. It's probably the same thing. Mm. And then it becomes a narrative of here are two points. Oh, it's been, there's been another sighting up here. It must be the same vessel again moving up and down the island. Mm. Um, so there you go, really. Uh, UFO sightings are certainly nothing new. Um, or what, what are we calling them now? UAP sightings. Is that, a, is that a military thing? Who calls them unidentified aerial phenomena these days? So it, it is the new term. It's a new term for the sheer fact that UFO kind of implies flying saucer. Right. And so scholars who work on this are going, well, we don't necessarily mean flying saucer when we talk mm. about an unidentified flying object in the sky. Sometimes we are simply talking about people misinterpreting natural phenomena or people not realizing there are planes or helicopters in their vicinity. Sometimes we're talking about covert military operations, including the development of stealth air aircraft that various military powers aren't willing to admit to at this particular point in time. So when we want to talk about unidentified aerial phenomena, we don't want something that makes people immediately go, oh, flying saucer, that's mm. nonsense. We want a term which is content neutral 
and then we can investigate those things more thoroughly to work out which particular aerial phenomena which was previously unidentified actually happens to be. Yes, I suppose it presupposes less, doesn't it? Flying implies that it's moving under its own power, yeah. whereas we could be talking about weird cloud formations or who the hell knows what. Aerial just or means in, in the sky. in many cases, so. a Chinese lantern. Indeed. Yes, you do get a bit of them around, don't you? Find them washed up on beaches after after any particular sort of event where those things yes, get Yes, and actually, talking. I mean, there's a whole literature in the annals of ufology, because unfortunately, UAP, U, U, UAPology? So ufology works as a mm. word yeah. uh, about the problems of Chinese lanterns for discerning good UFO sightings from bad ones because so often a UFO sighting turns out to be a Chinese lantern because a Chinese lantern in the wind will act in a very erratic fashion but then you discover that the sighting that person had X in Bristol is related to a wedding that was going on across the river. Mm. Interesting. I, in reading up for this, I have came across two different um, accounts of where the term flying saucer comes from. I read one of these things talked about it was a guy who was very much describing saucer-shaped spaceships. And yet I've also heard that the term came from a guy who described them as like saucers skipping across a, a pond or something, and that the, the actual craft, the, the, the UFOs he described, weren't saucer-shaped at all, and the saucer referred to the emotion. So frankly, I'm confused now. As are we all. Mm. So I believe that's it for the for this episode. Interesting to see that um, UFO sort of so, some of the stuff differs and some of the stuff stays uh, stays the same. And while there are conspiracy theories around secret stuff going on that certain powers don't want you to know about, the the nature of them and the specific identities of the powers um, can 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 differ with time. So you're saying the lyrics may change, but the song remains the same. That is exactly what I'm saying, and what I'll continue to say until my dying day. Although not for the foreseeable future, because for the foreseeable future, we're going to have bonus content for our patrons. Ah, yes, our lovely, lovely patrons. The people we love the most. Mm. Uh, and you could be one of the people could. we love the most by simply flinging us a few dollars a month. Mm. I mean, we still love you plenty right now, but we'd love you a little bit more. Yeah, so mm. go to our Patreon page, just look up the podcast's Guide to the Conspiracy, and Put a little bit of money our way, and you can also listen to exciting bonus content. And oh, the bonus content, the, bo the oh, bonus man. content, bonus. bonus That's content. how fancy it is. Yeah. We put a wee accent on it. Last week, uh, we shall be talking about Chernobyl, the series, and I guess Chernobyl, the actual incident. Um, we'll be talking about Jordan Peterson. What's that wacky scamp been up to? He's inventing Gab 2.0. Mm. Um, and we, we, I suppose we have to mention what's been going on in the Gulf of Oman at the moment. We do. And there'll be a very slight update on what's happening with the trial for our own local Christchurch terrorist. Mm. So, patrons, stick around for that. Non-patrons, uh, come back in a week and we'll have more stuff for you anyway. And next week is Newsweek. Oh, it is, it is. Yes, yeah. it'll be our first chance at trying out this brand new format. So, yes. It's going to be a lot of news, an mm. awful lot of news. Mm. So, good. Yeah. Mm. Uh, until then, keep watching the skies. Or the skies. Mm. been listening to the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy starring josh addison and dr m r x Dentit, which is written research recorded and produced by josh and m you can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its podbean or patreon campaigns and if you need to get in contact with either josh or m you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their twitter accounts monkey fluids and conspiracism Remember, Soylent Green is Meeple's.